Will the members please take their seats? The meeting will now come to order. As most of you know, I'm your town moderator, Brian Walsh, and welcome to our annual fall town meeting. Having been advised by the town clerk, Susan Galvin, the majority of town meeting members are in attendance, I hereby declare that a quorum is present for the transaction of business, and this meeting is now open. In addition, in keeping with our tradition, we will start our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Will the members please stand and join in with me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Before proceeding with the meeting, or the business of the meeting, there are certain preliminary matters to be taken up. First, permission has been requested for certain members and personnel of the School Committee Planning Board, Board of Health, and other boards, committees, departments who are not town meeting members to sit on the floor with other members of their respective boards, committees, departments upon, a, of course, the understanding that they will not vote. Hearing no objection from the body, such permission will be and hereby is accorded. Second, permission is granted to Milton Cablevision to televise these proceedings. All also, please note that we have two side aisle microphones, each with three seats in front, reserved for those wishing uh, to be recognized to speak. Third, I will now entertain a motion to use the rules for the conduct of this, our annual town meeting in May as the rules for this town meeting. It's been moved, seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Those will be our rules. Terrific. Some observations of this meeting, a couple of quick housekeeping things. I'd remind you to turn your cell phones to silent mode or vibrate, which I have done. I don't always remember. As we continue to adjust and improve the way we conduct our town meetings, we will use the very large screen on stage to display the recommendation that is before the body, as it is before the body. We will also attempt to capture and clearly identify any changes that have been made since the printing of the warrant. Many of you may recall a lengthy discussion at a previous session over the location and the meaning of a period. We will, not, we will want to be sure that no one is lost on what the changes are that we're discussing, and that can best be provided by having it displayed on this very large screen in front of you. Tonight, we have a re revised recommendation by the Warren Committee, and as we have in the past, we will pass out the papers, or you can uh, pick them up, and that is a, a blue paper. For Article 6. And we'll also display that new recommendation when we're at, when we're at that uh, article. Now, inter interestingly enough, as we move forward with these improvements, and I, I have no doubt that that will be an improvement, it will help focus and clarity, that we need to be careful that legal, legal procedures are also adhered to. Our town clerk is the official recording secretary of this meeting and files all voted motions with the Secretary of State's office. We need to make sure that even the smallest of changes, for example, a misspelling of the word the, is voted on as, as it is voted on is what is turned in. So we'll be very careful with any changes tonight, but your moderator may be introducing another slight addition to the rules at, of, a, of the meeting at our next May's annual town meeting to address this. Let me briefly explain tonight's schedule. Pursuant to Article 17 of the 2014 Annual Town Meeting, your moderator was instructed to appoint five members to the DPW Yard Study Committee and instruct them to make a report to town meeting, in addition to the Board of Selectmen. Tonight's session will begin their report. And while I'm waiting for the Chairman, Mr. Stanley, Stanley uh, Janega, to come forward, I'd also like to thank the members of the committee for their service. There's Stan, Stanley Janega, the Chairman, Marvin Gordon from Gun Hill Street, Kevin Burke from Wildwood Road, uh, Marie Armel Theodot from Clifton Road, and John Driscoll from Randolph Avenue. Thank you for your service. And Mr. Thank Genega, you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, 
Brian mentioned the, uh, the name. Uh, May 2014 town meeting uh, uh, established the committee, provided $35,000 for the study. Uh, it was done by a consultant, Weston and Sampson. Uh, it asked for the, to look at the spatial needs for the director of public works, consolidated facilities, parks and rec, and cemetery. Uh, cemetery opted out, and, and in uh, our judgment, uh, that was appropriate. If you look at the other three departments, those employees report to work in the morning to the DPW yard and head east one morning and west the next morning and so forth. The cemetery staff reports in and works within the confines of the cemetery. So if you were to have them report over to a centralized DPW yard, for example, to get their work assignments and pick up their equipment, you're probably looking at losing three quarters to an hour of productivity every day, and that uh, just didn't make sense to us. Uh, here are the, uh, Brian mentioned the committee members. We had staff advisors from the three departments that you see below, and I know you're familiar with those folks. Uh, take a look here at the bottom line. The bottom line is we've got 37,000 square feet, and by industry standards, we should have 72,000 square feet. Uh, Weston and Sampson compared our facilities to comparable towns, and clearly there's no town that's exactly the same. Uh, there's no DPW or Parks and Rec that's exactly the same. But when you compare them and look at a range, the 72,000 square feet is at the low end of comparable, so it's not excessive by any stretch of the imagination. Now, why do we need some facilities? Well, we're short facilities, but there are other reasons for needing facilities the DPW. If you look at this, parts of the storage garage are failing. What this picture doesn't bring along is, to use Joe Lynch's uh, uh, words at one point, where the smell of decaying wood that you get in all of these uh, facilities, I'm sorry I couldn't bring that along with the pictures, because it does add something. But you look at those holes in the roof, and uh, you see the water on the floor here. That, uh, my apologies, my tricky finger here. You see that this is all water on the floor. That picture's not coming up very well. But it comes through those holes in the roofs and not very pleasant uh, work environment. Uh, the mechanical systems, to call them dinosaurs, might insult dinosaurs, to be quite honest. Uh, buildings have reached a useful life there. When we took the committee through the place, the words that committee members used were uh, words like sad, depressing, and one shameful, even, for the condition of these facilities. Uh, you can't fit today's trucks into the garages. That's uh, like trying to take your 1925 home and put your new full-size automobile in it. It just doesn't work. Uh, you look at the way they try to get equipment stored in there, and it's jammed in in an attempt to keep some things indoors. And I'll talk more about indoor versus outdoor storage in just a moment. Uh, it says here that portions of the multi-million dollar fleet are stored outside. Actually, more than 50% of the equipment is stored outside. And just to give you some idea of the value of that equipment, if you were to replace the DPW equipment today, you're north of $12 million. If you throw in parks and rec and consolidated facilities, you're probably in the 15 to $18 million. So there's some pretty significant uh, equipment value uh, there. Uh, inadequate salt shed storage. Uh, obviously, we have winters here that require a lot. Uh, you see this picture, and behind it is the salt storage uh, facility, and uh, here, and this is stored outside, and what you see is this trail right here that uh, probably would cause us some trouble depending on who saw it when, uh, but, but we're actually leaching that salt into, uh, you know, into the surrounding area, the rest of the uh, uh, DPW yard. You see the foundation settling here. You see the roof cracked. Uh, you see here inadequate facilities. Some of the trucks can't fit in the maintenance facilities. Fire truck can't fit in there. Um, again, more than 50% of the equipment is stored outdoors. And that's exacerbated by, this is a different capital system than the facilities capital system, but you look at the way we're replacing the equipment. Trucks have a 10-year service life and we're replacing them in the 15 to 20 year range. Anybody driving a car or pickup truck that's 15 to 20 years old and driving it on a daily basis, show of hands? One. There's a good reason for that. 
and this is what we're doing here. So that's the outdoor storage is exacerbated by the age of the equipment. Uh, there's a documented story in Wayland, the last bullet up here. They bought three dump trucks at the same time, uh, brand new dump trucks, only had indoor storage for one. Long story short, uh, they ended up trying to sell the two trucks that were beat up, the two outdoor storage trucks, try to sell them at auction. And you can sell those things at auction where someone thinks they're going to put a few dollars into it and pretty it up and get it operating a little better and take it to some part of the world where uh, the regulations aren't quite so stringent as they might be here. Uh, they weren't able to do that. They had to sell them for scrap. That's the condition they were in. The one that was stored indoors gave them three more years of service and in fact was sold at auction and so it brought some money back to the town. That's the difference between storing inside and out and it isn't always exactly three years. It obviously depends on the usage and the, uh, and the uh, uh, climate uh, conditions. Uh, we gave very few pieces of direction to the consultant. Um, we said all three departments would stay at that site so their needs were what we were looking for. Uh, the one thing that we uh, were pretty hard over on was that they should establish traffic patterns to keep the public away from the operational traffic. If you look at it right now, you can almost get run over by a dump truck uh, if you're there to conduct some business in the administrative space, and, and, and that's, uh, you know, a safety issue. We took that 72,000 square feet and used some gross factors associated with it and figured out that it would cost us almost $33 million to start with a clean sheet of paper. And so that's why we told the consultant to, um, to use the existing buildings as much as possible. There are a couple of buildings there that are usable. They require some, uh, some work to them, but if you've got a solid structure and a solid roof, not many of those over there, as you can see from the picture, but there are a few, uh, you, you might as well take advantage of it and reduce that $33 million uh, somewhat. We, um, looked at 14 conceptual alternatives. If you're having trouble sleeping, you're, there's a copy of it over on the, in the library or you can get it on the town meeting website. I'm being just a little bit facetious. It didn't put us to sleep. It's, it, it is interesting if, uh, if, if, if you're into it. Uh, actually, you count 15 when you look at the clean sheet of paper, the $33 million one. Uh, we selected scheme 3C that's shown in the uh, report. And it uses three, uh, it really keeps four facilities, three buildings and the uh, fuel facility keeps that in place. Um, this is 4C and to orient you, this is um, entry road, um, shame on me, um, Randolph, I'm sorry, I had the R but I couldn't spit the rest of it out, Randolph. Uh, we're keeping this building which becomes uh, employee area. We're keeping this building, which is now the, um, or we, we propose keeping that building, which is now the vehicle maintenance facility, and it'll be done over into two-story admin and storage uh, space. And then keeping this area, or this area, which is uh, right now for storage, and it'll be used for vehicle storage. Um, this traffic pattern here keeps the, keeps the public traffic away from the operational traffic. And the operational traffic would come in here, be able to park here, pull out this way. And this counterclockwise flow, our experts tell us is the right thing to do because the driver's looking out the window and has the very best uh, view of what he's doing. And when you're moving heavy equipment around, obviously you, uh, you want that. Uh, I'd also add that one of the things it does for the abutters and all the citizens of Milton is provide a screen that uh, helped to make the place uh, look uh, a little more pleasing to the, uh, to the eye. Um, here's, here's two alternatives. A single contract is 26 million, nearly 27 million dollars. Um, the, these are not plush facilities by any stretch of the imagination. They're, they're kind of industrial commercial facilities, but uh, nonetheless, they're, they're what's necessary. We looked at one other alternative. Suppose you don't want to do this all at once. Um, as you might expect, there's some phasing that uh, you're forced into. You can't 
demolish or reuse the present equipment uh, maintenance facility until you've got an equipment maintenance facility and a new one and so forth. But we broke it down into three phases and what you get out of that is more money. You can stretch that out uh, as much as you want, but it's going to cost you more and more and more uh, is the bottom line. Um, our recommendation to the Board of Selectmen was uh, looking to uh, support town meeting providing on the next go-round $675,000 for preliminary engineering and that would get us the kinds of activities that you see here, foundation work, hazardous materials identification, so you could begin to put more exact prices on, for example, what it'll take to get the asbestos and whatever else is, uh, is in those old facilities out, uh, and then ultimately outline specifications. And uh, that concludes uh, our effort. Um, we enjoyed it and hope it'll make a good contribution to the town and hope you town meeting will support uh, going on with this in the future. Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Nega. Appreciate that. Great job. So now let's proceed to Article 1, which you will find on page 9 in your warrant. And I might point out we have eight articles before us tonight. Some of them are, are actually uh, pretty perfunctory and should go fast, but it's my belief that even with a thorough discussion where necessary, we should be able to complete this town meeting tonight. Let's try. Okay, Article 1 on page 9. I am going to read you, since the, the article and the recommendation are essentially similar, I'm going to page 11 and to read you uh, the recommendation of the Warren Committee, which becomes the main motion before the body. It is recommended the town vote to amend Chapter 20 of the General Bylaws by deleting the words Board of Selectmen, wherever they appear, and inserting in their place the words Town Administrator. And by deleting the, from the membership of the Police Chief Screening Committee the words Executive Secretary of the Board of Selectmen, and inserting in their place the words One Member of the Board of Selectmen designated by the Board of Selectmen, such that Chapter 20 of the General Bylaws would read as follows. Chapter 20, Chief of Police, Section 1. Upon the occurrence of a vacancy in the office of the police chief, the town administrator shall appoint a committee of six persons to be called the Police Chief Screening Committee, here and after the committee, which shall be comprised of A, one member of the Board of Selectmen, designated by the Board of Selectmen, B, a member of the Personnel Board, C, a current sworn member of the Milton Police Department, and D, three residents of the town, not in paid service of the town, either elected, appointed, or hired, at least one of them whom shall have had substantial experience in law enforcement or related field. The town administrator shall fill vacancies on the committee as they may occur. The committee shall make all decisions by majority vote, including the election of the committee chair. No person appointed by the committee shall be eligible for appointment to the then current vacancy in the office of police chief. The committee shall be dissolved upon the swearing in of the newly chosen police chief. Section 2. Upon their appointment, and except in the situation described in the next paragraph herein, the committee shall review applications for the office of police chief only from persons who satisfy the following requirements on the date of application for the position of police chief. A, having at least eight years of experience in law enforcement work, and B, currently serving as a sworn member of the Milton Police Department in the permanent rank of sergeant or lieutenant with at least one year of prior service in either rank. In the event the committee shall received by a publicly announced first application deadline, fewer than six applicants from persons fulfilling both requirements A and B as set forth in the previous paragraph, then the committee shall review such applica applications already received from permanent sergeants and or lieutenants of the Milton Police Department, together with applications from any other currently serving sworn members of the Milton Police Department, whether in the permanent rank of patrolman, sergeant, or lieutenant having at least eight years of experience in law enforcement work and who submit applications for the position of police chief by a publicly announced second application deadline. Section 3. The committee may at their discretion and subject to appropriation employ the services of a professional search consultants. In examination of the qualifications of applicants, the committee shall apply the following criteria in addition to other reasonable criteria deemed appropriate by the committee. A. 
the results of a written examination or other assessment of leadership ability and management skills administered by a qualified testing agency or company recommended by the committee and selected by the town administrator, B, educational credentials, C, experience in law enforcement and related fields, and D, familiarity with the problems of law enforcement in the town of Milton. The committee may interview as many as such applicants as the committee deem necessary to form reasoned judgments. Section four, upon the completion of the process required under sections two and three, the committee shall select three qualified finalists, prepare a written analysis of each, and forward a list of such qualified finalists to the town administrator. In the event one or more said qualified finalists withdraws from consideration at any time prior to the swearing in of the newly chosen police chief, the committee shall, upon a request of the town administrator, select and forward as recommended additional qualified finalists, equal in the number of the, to those finalists having withdrawn, to be added to the list of recommended finalists. In seeking additional qualified finalists, the committee may consider applications already submitted and may set additional deadlines for late applicants, applications to be considered. All said additional qualified finalists must meet the requirements of Section 2. Section 5, the town administrator shall investigate the qualified finalists recommended by the committee and shall choose the police chief from the list of qualified finalists recommended by the committee. The committee and the town administrator shall conduct this selection process in an expeditious, excuse me, in an expeditious manner. Okay, that is the motion before the body. I recognize the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Hurley, uh, for comments. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Tom Hurley, chairman of the Board of Selectmen, uh, town meeting member, uh, precinct five. Um, the, uh, the Board of Selectmen would like to propose a friendly amendment, uh, and let me preface this by saying, this article was meant clearly to be housekeeping. Uh, as you recall, last, uh, last May we voted um, a home rule petition to be submitted uh, for a strong town administrator. We thought that that uh, strong town administrator uh, home rule petition would have been received by now. It has not. Um, we have no reason to suspect that it won't be received shortly, but um, at the time that this thing went to print, we were still hoping we'd have it. So the, the amendment that I'd like to propose as a friendly amendment uh, uh, is, um, to add the following language at the end of the recommendation, that be contingent upon approval by the legislature and signature by the governor of legislation entitled an act relative to the town administrator in the town of Milton. So folks, let me explain what's going on, uh, and this is all in the interest of, of doing this appropriately and quickly. The Board of Selectmen originally submitted this article. The, the Warren Committee made a recommendation, and so the Board of Selectmen has said, hey, look, we noticed that there's something that should be added here. Um, the Warren Committee is, and is asked to have it as a, accepted as a friendly amendment, which would mean the Warren Committee would have to accept it as part of their recommendation before you. The Warren Committee is currently taking a vote to see if they will accept that as a friendly amendment. Does anyone wish to speak to the motion to amend while we're discussing it, or are you, do you wish to speak to the main motion when we get back to it? Thank you. Mr. Hayes, you are recognized for purposes of telling us whether you'll accept that as a friendly amendment. Good evening, Ted Hayes, uh, town meeting member, precinct three, and chair of your warrant committee. So uh, we are in favor of the friend of this uh, friendly amendment. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so folks, again for clarity, the verbiage that uh, your chairman of the board of selectmen read to you is now added at the very end of the recommendation before the body. So it's part of it now. Yes, Mr. Julian, do you wish to be recognized to speak to the motion? Frank Giuliano, Precinct 3. 
Is, is that working? Can you hear? Perhaps you can go to the front middle one. Let's, let's take a look. That's, well. So there's only one person going to apply for the job. You have to have eight years of experience and a sworn member of the Milton Police Department in permanent rank of sergeant or lieutenant with at least one year of sworn. So no one, you can't get an outside person in here. That's correct. No outside person. No. That's, that's correct. That's, that's what the motion before the body is. Does anyone else wish to speak to this motion? Mr. Mullen, you're recognized. Peter Mullen, Precinct 2. Um, I believe, and I'm not sure of this, but I believe we currently have a rank in the police department of deputy chief. Uh, and it would appear under the language of this um, article that the deputy chief would not be eligible. Um, I don't think that's the intent. I don't know whether that's a permanent rank or whether that's just a temporary uh, title that people are given. Fair enough. Good question. While we're trying to get that answer, uh, do you wish to be recognized? Ms. Sheridan, you're recognized. Linda Lee Sheridan, Precinct 9. Um, in section, can you hear me? In section 3, now you can. It says the committee may at, the, at their discretion and subject to appropriation employ the service of services of professional search consultants. I'm wondering, since we're only hiring from within the Milton Police Department, why we would need professional search consultants? Just a question. Miss, Mrs. Sheridan, it's a good question, but what, which section is that in? Um, the top of page 12, section 3. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Hurley, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I'd just like to answer Mr. Mullen's question. Um, the, the, the reason for the wording the way it is, um, is there is no civil service position of deputy chief. So technically, the deputy chief uh, is a lieutenant that is on leave from his lieutenant's position to become deputy chief. But he still is a lieutenant, in, according to civil service. That's and, the and, that and, so, and so, Mr. Hurley, the deputy chief would indeed be eligible to be yes, considered. Yes, as a lieutenant. Thank you. Um, the, the other thing I'd like to say, um, keep in mind that none of the language, um, th this has been the, the selection process for the chief for many, many, many years now, since 1980-something. Uh, nothing has changed in this except for changing the word selectman to town administrator. It's exactly the same exactly the same as we've done it for the past 30 some odd years. So Mr. Hurley, why are there, and not meaning to put you on the spot, but assuming that you might want to address it, Mrs. Sheridan's question is essentially saying that in fact if we're going to keep the uh, applicants within the, uh, the, the department, does in fact, sh does it still make sense to have the committee available at their discretion the opportunity to employ the services of a professional search, search consultants? Um, I believe that 
typically it's not done. I, I, I would guess typically that, that they have not availed themselves to that in the past, but to, to allow them the opportunity, um, keep in mind there, there are 50 some odd positions in the police department uh, or personnel. Um, I mean, there, there could potentially be a lot of people to look at. Um, you know, typically it would first be done lieutenant and sergeant, but... Um, so, so, for example, Mr. Hurley, just to help, the, the, um, the, the services of a professional search consultant might indeed not be necessarily to search for applicants, but to help them with uh, going through the applicants... The, the process of selection, yes. Okay. I'm looking for Mrs. Sheridan. Does that satisfy your question? Mr. Mullen, is that, your question has been addressed. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak? Yes, ma'am, you're recognized. Kathleen Potter, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 2. I may be opening a can of words, worms, but um, why do we only hire from within? Why, don't, why can't we include exterior? I don't understand, and if I'm opening a can of worms, I'm sorry. So the good news tonight is we, I guess, we don't have to concern ourselves with the score of the Red Sox game. <laughs> Mr. Hurley, you recognized. Yes. Uh, again, this, this probably predates all of us uh, at the table here, but my understanding is, uh, and, and if somebody would, uh, you know, I'm sure there is somebody out there, I'm, I'm staring right at him right now that probably has the answer better than I do. But uh, my understanding is uh, it was an agreement that was made with the unions uh, at some point in time uh, and basically to, re uh, to remove the police chief from the civil service ranks. Is that correct, John Cronin? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Does anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Mr. Hayes, you're recognized as the chair of the Warren Committee for the last word on the recommendation. Okay, Ted Hayes, uh, town meeting member, precinct three. Um, I think it's good that people are looking at the possible failings of some of the language here, and, but changing them would likely be the subject of a different article at a different time. Um, I just wanted to observe that that as far as employing uh, the services of a professional search consultant, uh, that would be subject to appropriation. And so that would be reviewed um, by this committee. Thank you. Thank you. This motion will require a majority vote. All those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. Motion carries. Well, Article two. Yes, Mr. Mullen. Isn't this an amendment to the bylaws and requires a two-thirds vote? Mr. Uh, uh, Town Council, you recognized. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Moderator, Town Meeting Members, this requires a majority vote. To amend your general bylaws requires a majority vote. To amend your zoning bylaws requires a two-thirds vote because this is a general bylaw it requires only a majority vote. It's a good question, Mr. Mullen. It's one I asked myself with town council in preparing for the meeting. But I, I prefer on, on questions like that where we have town council present, the town council to address the answers. Thank you. So that, that motion has been made. It was seconded. It was voted. It's in the books. We are on to Article 2. And I'm going to read the recommendation, which begins at the bottom of page 13. It is recommended the vote, excuse me, it is recommended the town vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to petition the General Court to amend Section 2 of Chapter 272 of the Acts of 1989 by deleting the words Board of Selectmen and inserting in their place the words Town Administrator and by deleting the word are and inserting in its place the word is. So that Section 2 shall read, notwithstanding the provisions of Section 97 of Chapter 41 of the General Laws, or any other general or special law to the contrary, upon the occurrence of a vacancy in the Office of Police Chief in the Town of Milton, 
the town administrator of said town is empowered to fill such vacancy in all future vacancies by appointment of a police chief under a contract for a term of years not to exceed five years. Such appointment shall be made in accordance with the procedures set forth in the town bylaws. Upon the appointment of a police chief in accordance with said procedures, said town administrator is empowered to appoint a current sworn member of the police department of said town and is acting as acting police chief to fill such vacancy. It is provided, the general court, provided that the general court may reasonably vary the form and substance of the requested legislation within the scope of the general public objectives of this petition. This will require a majority vote, and I would ask our Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, do we have the same issue as in Article 1? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, yes, we do. Again, this was housekeeping. Uh, this was a home rule petition in 1989 uh, that really gave way to the, 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 by, the bylaw that we just previously changed. Um, and, and again, all we're trying to do is, uh, is uh, put in uh, strong town, uh, town administrator where it used to read Board of Selectmen. Um, again, since the strong town administrator um, uh, bylaw has, or Home rule petition is not passed. Uh, I would move again as a friendly amendment uh, that we rec recommend our, uh, recommendation in Article 2 by adding the following language at the end of the recommendation contingent upon the approval by the legislature and signature by the governor uh, of the legislation entitled An Act Relative to the Town of Milton. I'd like to recognize the chair of our Warren Committee, Mr. Hayes, to see if you're going to accept that as part of your recommendation as a friendly amendment. The Warren Committee is happy to accept that Thank you. recommendation. Thank you. Okay. So for clarity for the body, that verbiage that Mr. Hurley read, which I have here, is now added at the very end of that recommendation. And again, it's, it's uh, sort of a house cleaning. It's been accepted. It's part of the recommendation in front of you. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Again, it requires a majority vote. All those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. Recommendation carries. Article 3. Abandon the wind turbine project, appropriate remaining amounts borrowed, and rescind the unissued balance. <clears throat> Excuse me. To see if the town will vote to abandon the project of construction, erection, installation, and maintenance of wind turbines on land owned by the town of Milton, the wind turbine project, as approved by the vote of February 22, 2010, Milton Special Town Meeting under Article 4, subsection 2, appropriate for a different purpose, the remaining amount borrowed for the wind turbine project and no longer necessary to pay costs of that project, and section 3, rescind the unissued balance of the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay costs of the wind turbine project and to act on anything related thereto. <clears throat> this is submitted by the Board of Selectmen and it is recommended that the, that the town vote to abandon sec section one, abandon the project for construction, erection, installation, and maintenance of wind turbines on land owned by the town of Milton, the wind turbine project, as approved by the vote of February 22, 2010, Milton Town Special Town Meeting under Article 4, subsection 2, appropriate the remaining amount borrowed for the wind turbine project, as approved and no longer necessary to pay costs of that project, to pay costs approved by the votes of May 4, 2015, in May 6, 2013, Milton Annual Town Meeting of $13,625.95 for fire building improvement and repairs and $350,000 for the reconstruction of the DPW locker rooms in the cemetery garage and three, rescind the unissued balance of the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay costs for the wind turbine project. This will require a two-thirds vote and I would recognize the chairman of our Board of Selectmen, Mr. Hurley. 
Thank you, Mr. Monitor. Tom Hurley, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, uh, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 5. Um, so it's essentially, all we're really doing here, um, uh, just a, as a little bit of history, um, we tried to build a wind turbine uh, near Granite Links Golf Course on um, the, just off the dump access road. Um, and there was a significant amount of, of litigation with respect to that. The golf course opposed it. Um, we won most of, well actually we won all of the litigation. Uh, what we did not lose, but came out with, with half a victory on was the, the lease that we have with Quarry Hills uh, requires, and, and Quarry Hills argued that, um, that we were harming their leasehold by building the turbine. That lease uh, had bi a binding arbitration clause in it, so it did go to arbitration. Uh, what happened was um, the arbitrator ruled that the wind turbine could be built, but it could not operate during normal golfing hours, uh, which upon further analysis uh, made it dubious at best whether we could ever recover the cost of building the wind turbine, let alone adding any uh, cost savings to the town. So for that reason, you know, we've been holding off for a while, but it, it's become obvious that we're not going to build a wind turbine on that, on that site. We had um, spent some money, uh, approximately a million dollars, um, uh, leading up to it, uh, some utility poles were, uh, uh, were changed and uh, a few other things. We had bonded, um, well, about $350,000 more than we spent because you typically uh, finance and bond in anticipation and then the project came to a halt. So we've been holding on to this $350,000 for uh, a few years now. Uh, we do have some capital projects in front of us uh, and basically uh, we have the, the DPW locker room and the uh, cemetery garage, which were previously approved capital projects in 2012 and 2013, which are, we borrowed, I think the total cost of those things are uh, $650,000 between the two projects. We borrowed um, $300,000 uh, on it so far. So this is available cash that we won't have to bond again uh, that we can use to pay the remaining balance of the cost of building those two facilities. Um, there's a little more money left over and uh, it's, it's just a small amount more that is uh, going to go to, again, the repairs to the fire station, uh, which again was approved by town meeting, I believe, last May. Thank you, Mr. Hurley. Does anyone else wish to speak to this motion? Seeing none again, oh, yes. We do have someone who would like to speak to the motion. <laughs> Brian Kelly, tell me, I mean, uh, Precinct 7. Um, just a question. It seems to me that we're going to be discussing doing some work at the DPW yard in the near future. Would we be uh, destroying these? Um, New lockers that we'd pay three hundred fifty thousand for, Good question. and then in a couple of years, if we do some work, so maybe we should put off on that until we decide what we're going to do in the. Well, let's get the answer to your question first, Mr. Hurley. You recognized. Thank you, Mr. Moderate. Um, the the facility that will be built, uh, and it will be a new facility, uh, will be retained. Uh, it will be a building retained with the new DPW facility. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is it's it's part of a union grievance, so we do have to address it. Um, somehow soon. Thank you. Thank you. I remind you this will require a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's unanimous. Thank you. Article 4. And I'm going to read just the recommendation, which you will find at the bottom of page 15. It's recommended the town vote to rescind the authorized but unused balance of the amount authorized to borrow to be borrowed to pay costs of the East Milton Deck Project, so-called, as approved by the town under Article 8 of the Warrant at the May 6, 2013 Annual Town Meeting in the unissued balance, balances of the amounts authorized to be borrowed to pay costs of medical expenses as approved by the town under Article 14 of the Warrant at the May 2, 2011 Annual Town Meeting and under Article 13 of the Warrant at the May 8th 2012 
annual town meeting. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Seeing none, this requires a majority vote. All those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimous. Article 5. Article 5, you, I'm going to read you the recommendation. As you all can see, it is, a, um, it is a table that's the meat of this article in front of you. I'm going to read to you the, the verbiage before the table, and then I'm going to read you the pertinent information of the table, which is to say there's a purpose that this, this money is being transferred from, how much and where it's going to as part of this recommendation. And so for clarity, I believe it's the best way to represent it to you although in your warrant you have the full detail with dates, et cetera. So Article 5, it is recommend the town vote to appropriate the remaining amount borrowed for the below purposes as approved and no longer necessary to pay costs for that pur of that purpose and to pay costs of improvements to designated purposes as outlined below. So from a DPW equipment sidewalk, sidewalk tractor unspent proceeds of $8,034.01 be transferred to fire building improvements. From the DPW equipment MADVAC, unspent proceeds of $2,089.45 be transferred to roadways. The DPW access security gate, unspent proceeds of $2,773.47 be transferred to fire building improvements. The truck lift system, central maintenance, unspent proceeds of $25,000 be transferred to the fire building improvements. The backup generator for town hall and PMS, unspent proceeds of $34,855.46 be transferred to roadways. The upgrade to town hall ethernet cable, unspent proceeds of $9,304.59 be transferred to roadways. The replacement of the town telephone system, unspent proceeds of $87.24 be transferred to roadways. The MHS duct work, unspent proceeds of $67,149.86 be transferred to the fire building improvements. The F-250 truck, unspent proceeds of $1,271.79 be transferred to fire building improvements. The F-250 truck unspent proceeds of $118.21 be transferred to roadways. The re replace election voting booths unspent proceeds of $850 be transferred to roadways. The reconstruct Fe Kelly Field tennis courts unspent proceeds of $27,144.92 be transferred to fire building improvements. The leak correlation equipment unspent proceeds of $1,402.23 get transferred to the water sewer meter replacement. This will require a two-thirds vote. Does anyone wish to speak to this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation of the Warren Committee say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's unanimous. Article 6. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to read the intro article, but I want to point out that when we get to the recommendation, that has been revised. You should have received it or found it as your blue sheets. There's plenty of them on the table. Article 6, increase the Board of Selectmen from three to five members. To see if the town will vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to file a petition with the General Court to enact legislation which provide that notwithstanding any other general law or special law to the contrary, that at the next annual town election after passage of such legislation, but not earlier than the 2017 annual town election, the Milton Board of Selectmen shall consist of five members in which would provide without limitation a process for an election to fill the two new positions for no change in the term of office of the then currently serving members and for staggered terms of the five members of the Board of Selectmen provided the general court may reasonably vary the form and substance of the requ requested legislation within the scope of the general public objectives of the petition. 
and to act on anything related thereto. This was submitted by the Town Government Study Committee. And now I'm going to read you the revised recommendation, which I hope is up in front of you. It is recommended in the town vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to petition the General Court to enact legislation related to the membership of the Board of Selectmen in substantially the following form, provided that the General Court may reasonably vary the form and substance of the requested legislation within the scope of the general public objectives of the petition. An act increasing the membership of the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Milton from three to five members. Be it enacted by the Senate in the House of Representatives and General Court assembled and by authority of the same as follows. Section 1. Notwithstanding any provisions of the general or special law to the contrary, the number of members of the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Milton shall be increased from three to five. The Board of Selectmen shall annually elect a chairperson from among its members. Section 2. At the first annual town election, the following acceptance of this act by the voters of the town but in no event prior to the 2017 annual town election, three selectmen shall be elected. The candidate receiving the highest number of votes in that election shall serve a three-year term. The candidate receiving the second highest number of votes shall serve a two-year term. And the candidate receiving the third highest number of votes shall serve a one-year term. Thereafter, as the terms of selectmen expire, successors shall be elected for terms of three years. The terms of, the mem of those members currently serving as selectmen at the time of the adoption of this act shall be unchanged by the adoption of this act. Section 3. This act shall be submitted for acceptance to the voters of the Town of Milton at the next annual or special town election following its passage in the form of the following question which shall be placed on the official ballot. Shall an act passed by the General Court entitled an act increasing the membership of the Board of Selectmen from the Town of Milton from three to five members be accepted. If a majority of the votes cast in answer to this question is in the affirmative, sections one and two of this act shall thereupon take effect, but not otherwise. Section four, section three of this act shall take effect upon its passage. Now this is uh, submitted by the Town Government Committee and I would now recognize Rick Neely, Chairman of the Town Government Study Committee, for remarks. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Rick Neely, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 3, and Chairman of the Town Government Study Committee. The genesis of this article came about from the Department of Revenue report that was issued in 2013. And you recall that we've been before you for several articles over the last couple of years some of which, most of which came out of that report. And the idea of going from three members to five members in the Board of Selectmen was an idea that was amongst the 32, 33 recommendations they had in that report. And what's happened is the committee over the last couple of years has had a subcommittee that has examined and conducted research, spent a considerable amount of time bringing a lot of material together. And I'm going to have Phil Matthews and Leroy Walker make a presentation tonight for the research they've conducted over the last two years. Uh, the committee had a considerable amount of debate on this thing, and uh, it was approved and passed by the committee. And I'll call upon Phil and Leroy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Mr. Matthews and Mr. Walker, you are recognized. Good evening. Uh, Phil and I are going to take just a few minutes of your time to talk with you about the process that the Town Government Study Committee went through uh, in considering this question. Uh, we'd like to talk to you about the research that was conducted, uh, what we found, and the conclusions that that led us to. Uh, as Rick said, this was a, a charge that uh, initially the DOR looked at and then was given to the Town Government Study Committee. The, the idea that we took was to gather uh, as many different perspectives as we could uh, about this question. That is, uh, are there benefits to be gained by uh, changing the number of selectmen uh, that are responsible for governing our town? Uh, we wanted to make sure that we gathered experience uh, wherever it was 
So we talked with uh, sitting selectmen. We talked with former selectmen of the town. Uh, we talked with our current town administrator. Uh, we talked with our former town administrator, Kevin Mern. Uh, we talked with people at the state government level who could give us some guidance on trends that they were seeing and how this uh, issue is approached across the Commonwealth and talked with individuals at Mass Municipal as well, which is a great resource for uh, anyone considering changes in governance in the Commonwealth. In addition, we thought it a good idea to talk with uh, elected officials in other towns, uh, both those who have gone through this process, those who have switched from uh, three-member boards to five-member boards, and as you can see, we talked with uh, individuals in 14 towns across the Commonwealth. So what did we find? Uh, a number of things, and first I'll talk about five-member board and then the three-member board uh, relative advantages and disadvantages. Uh, at the five-member board level, uh, one of the advantages that was very clear um, and obvious was that uh, you can better distribute the workload among five uh, executive level members of a board versus three. Uh, that certainly that should also provide uh, increased accessibility, that is, for residents that are seeking to talk with their selectmen about an issue that they're concerned about or a question that they have. Uh, five gives them uh, a better opportunity to, as <laughs> at getting to someone quickly. Um, next was, we thought, a very important one, which was um, greater efficiency and opportunity for offline discussions. As uh, many of you may know, uh, with a three-member board, uh, any two members having a conversation constitutes a quorum, and therefore those discussions can only occur in the context of a public meeting that's posted. Uh, with a five-member board, you have a much greater opportunity to have offline discussions. And I think uh, any of our current selectmen or, or other individuals in the town that have served us in the past would tell you that uh, the opportunity to talk offline to work things through, to talk about uh, where uh, an individual might be on a particular issue is, is a clear advantage. Um, next, that in addition to that ability to have offline discussions is also the opportunity to have subcommittees and to actually delegate uh, a particular, the examination of a particular issue to a subcommittee and have that subcommittee come back to uh, the larger body. Finally, um, ease of operation on difficult issues, uh, a little harder perhaps to get a consensus, that is to get at least three votes on a matter, uh, but perhaps even more importantly, a broader diversity of views and a broader um, number of perspectives on a given issue. Um, the one possible disadvantage that we found uh, based on these conversations and the other research that we did, uh, potentially, uh, an increase in the workload of the town administrator. Uh, but interestingly, what we found, and, and Phil is going to talk to you about uh, stats and trends that, that uh, we discovered and uncovered, that particularly coupled with a strong town administrator where that individual is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the town, uh, that often it may not, in fact, result in an increased workload. For the three-member board, um, increased transparency. That is, that if, uh, as I alluded to earlier, all of the business must be conducted in an open meeting, uh, then everyone gets to see exactly what's discussed uh, and how. Um, of course, that's true as long as uh, those discussions are uh, conducted in public session, uh, an executive session, obviously, uh, that transparency is not there. And the converse of the uh, disadvantage on the five-member side, perhaps uh, a, a lesser workload for the town administrator. Um, the disadvantage, obviously, with the inability to spread the workload is an increased workload 
uh, for the board. So Phil is going to talk about uh, stats and trends that he found, and then I'll come back and just say a few words about uh, conclusions that all of this led us to. Good evening, Phil Matthews, town meeting member precinct three, a member of the town government study committee. Uh, in addition to the qualitative research that we did with discussions among those 14 towns, we looked at the issue from a quantitative perspective as well. And working with information provided by the Mass Municipal Association, we discovered that there were 298 communities across the state today that have a town meeting form of government with a boards of selectmen as the executive authority. Uh, about 157 of them, or slightly more than half, have three member boards. Uh, slightly less than half, or 140, have five member boards. And one community has a seven member board, the town of Wakefield. They like their politics, I guess, in Wakefield. Um, we discovered two pertinent trends um, that have been taking place in uh, this area. Uh, one of them is toward a five-member board among a great many towns, and the other is toward a city or a town council form, as we've seen in communities locally. Fifteen communities have increased from three to five member boards of selectmen uh, in the last 12 years. Um, and a few communities like Weymouth, Braintree, and Randolph in our neck of the woods have switched to a city or a town council form of government as they found that the town meeting form of government was no longer meeting their needs. If you look at the community size and the size of Board of Selectmen a little more closely, uh, you, it proves to be an interesting read. If you look at it by community size, what you discover is that if you look there between five and 10,000 in population, 99 of those communities, or a full 63% of the towns with three member boards, fit into that very tiny community bracket. Uh, another 32 fit into the five to 10, so that between the two of them, 83% of all communities with three member boards exist in communities that have less than 10,000 people. Uh, and when you get to a larger town, 20,000 plus, the category that we fit into, there are only five communities left uh, in the state, or 11%, who have a five-member board, a three-member board, where on the opposite side you'll see 89% of the communities um, in that size category have a five-member board of selectmen. So um, if we look at some of the communities, that have a five-member board. These are communities with 20,000 plus population. I'm not gonna read them to you. I just thought I would put them up on the screen. Again, there are 39 communities with populations greater than 20,000 with five-member boards, including these communities here. If you look at the communities that have three member boards in that population range, what you find is communities of Milton, Milford, Belmont, Hingham, and Marshfield. These are the only uh, five of the 44 communities that maintain a three member board of selectmen. And we were just notified, I was just notified a week ago at the annual convention of town finance committees by a finance committee member in Marshfield that they have just appointed a charter review commission and one of the issues that they will be studying as well is the size of the board in that town. The overwhelming propensity for towns with larger populations, with larger budgets and with greater complexity to have five member boards is undoubtedly what led the Massachusetts Department of Revenue to make this following recommendation in their financial review report to the town. I'm not gonna read it, but it makes some of the same points that our presentation has made. It points out that um, a five member board is more conducive for a larger, more complex institution, that it is better fit for a role of selectmen that move away from the day-to-day -day operation of a community and place that responsibility in the hands of a strong town administrator. They function more as a board of directors, and if you are familiar at all with the private sector type 
uh, structure for these things. A five-member board of directors is a much more appropriate size than a three-member board. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is in all the research that we did with the communities and in all of our discussions with the Mass Municipal Association, we could not find a single community that had made the switch from three to five uh, member boards of selectmen and had ever had buyer's remorse and had ever gone back to a three member board of selectmen. In fact, when I spoke to this issue with members of the boards of selectmen in some communities, uh, one of them had a an answer that, that I remember quite vividly. His name was Chuck Woodard. He was the chair of the Board of Selectmen in Sudbury. And when I asked him whether, why he thought it was that none of the communities had had a second thought once they had made that switch. And he said, Phil, more brains, more educational backgrounds, more work capacity, more areas of expertise, more perspectives on solving problems more representation for the citizens of the town, what's not to like? And that, I think, sums up the reaction, the qualitative reaction that we got from the communities that we, we spoke to over a two-year period. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. Mr. Walker, you wish to be recognized, or are you finished? So if you're wondering why, um, it took two of us to do this presentation. Rick asked us, um, so which one of you guys is going to do this presentation tonight? And we've been partnering on this presentation for the last six months, so we said both of us. If that inspires any of you to do any, how many town government study committee members does it take to screw in a light bulb <laughs> jokes? Please uh, commit them to writing and submit them to the moderator, and if he thinks any of them are good enough, he'll read them after this. So where did that lead us? That the five-member board model does offer um, a significant number of advantages over the three-member model. That uh, the management of a town with a $100 million budget, which is about where we are now, uh, presents significantly different complexities than the management of a town with a budget a quarter or a half that size. Uh, 